Our scripture reading this morning comes from Matthew chapter 25, beginning with the 14th verse. Again, it will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted his property to them. To one he gave five talents of money, to another two talents, to another one talent, each according to his ability. Then he went away on his journey. The man who had received the five talents went at once and put his money to work and gained five more. So also the one with two talents gained two more. But the man who had received the one talent went off, dug a hole in the ground, and hid his master's money. After a long time, the master of those servants returned and settled accounts with them. The man who had received the five talents brought the other five. Master, he said, you entrusted me with five talents. See, I have gained five more. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. The man with the two talents also came. Master, he said, you entrusted me with two talents. See, I have gained two more. His master replied, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. Then the man who had received the one talent came. Master, he said, I knew that you were a hard man, harvesting where you have not sown and gathering where you have not scattered seed. So I was afraid, and I went out and I hid your talent in the ground. See, here is what belongs to you. His master replied, You wicked, lazy servant! So you knew that I harvest where I have not sown, and I gather where I have not scattered seed? Well, then you should have put my money on deposit with the bankers, so that when I returned I would have received it back with interest. Take the talent from him and give it to the one who has the ten talents. For everyone who has will be given more, and he will have abundance. Whoever does not have, even what he does have, will be taken away from him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The other day, I was doing something I don't do much. I was listening to the radio. There was a radio pastor on, and I really don't listen to them much, but this guy had one of those voices that was calming and soothing and he was the kind of guy that his voice just melted all fear away. And a woman called in, and she was crying. She'd obviously been crying for a while. She said, Pastor, I was born blind. And I've been blind all my life. I, you know, I just don't mind being blind so much. It's the only thing I've ever known. But I have these Christian friends, see, and they tell me that if I had more faith, I could be healed. I don't, that confuses me. I don't know what to say or do in, in, in the face of that. The pastor thought a minute and says, Well, tell me, do you carry one of those white canes with the red on the bottom? She said, Well, sure I do. He said, Well, the next time somebody says something like that to you, you whack them in the head with that cane. Then you tell them if they had more faith, it wouldn't hurt. Some folks will say most anything. The passage of scripture that we just read is from a section of Jesus' teachings that Bible scholars call the Little Apocalypse. The Big Apocalypse, of course, is the book we call Revelation, the Revelation to St. John. There has been a change in the way we use the word apocalypse since Jesus' time. We think of an apocalypse as always having to do with the end of time. The end of the world, it's all over at the apocalypse. Well, sometimes it does mean that, but that just because of the way we've come to use it. Apocalypse does not always deal with the end of the world. In this little apocalypse it does, but the word apocalypse means only one thing. Revelation. That's why the book of Revelation is called so-called the Apocalypse of St. John. It's the revelation that God gave to St. John. Now a lot of what folks want to do 
Well, what they want God to reveal to them is what the end of time is going to look like. In this case, Jesus had just told the disciples that there would come a day when the temple would not be there anymore. Remember, he said that not one stone would be left upon another. Well, they left the temple when he said that. They went out to the Mount of Olives, and the disciples were murmuring behind him all the way. You know, I can hear these 12 guys bumping about the, the loss of the temple. And when they get out to the Mount of Olives, they say to him in Matthew 24, verse 3, they say, when, tell us when this will be. And what will be the sign of your coming at the end of the age? So this revelation, this apocalypse, is in fact about the end of time because that's the question that they ask. Jesus launched into this series of teachings of what the end would look like. But Jesus refused to answer the question the way they wanted it answered. They wanted specifics. You know, like the Maya say it's going to be the 21st of December, 2012. Well, how many times have you lived through the end of the world? <laughs> Been there, done that. I'm not worried about it. <laughs> Anytime they give me specifics, I'm pretty comfortable with at least that day. If the end of the world is coming, it'll come before that or after that, but it won't be that day because nobody will know. Instead of giving them something specific, Jesus said in verse 13, Keep awake, therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour. The long and short of what Jesus said over the whole of the little apocalypse is this. You live in a broken world. Things are going to look bad a lot. It will come to an end one day, but you will never figure out when. So, instead of wasting your time trying to figure out what the end is going to look like, live like you want to be caught living when the end does come. And that's where this passage fits in the best. We're supposed to live in a world that is broken and looks bad a lot. But how are we supposed to live in a broken world that looks bad a lot? Well, this particular Peace, verse 14 to 29, have lots of good lessons in it. They call them permanent lessons because they've been good lessons since the beginning. Since Jesus spoke them, people have been able to draw good teaching and good lessons from them. And unless the human condition changes, we will always be able to draw good lessons from these verses. As there are several of those lessons in here, but as you might guess, have if you happen to have looked at the title of the sermon or read the sign out front, the one we're going to pick this morning is on faithfulness. Now, the most faithful people in Jesus' time, according to their culture and according to themselves, were the Pharisees. And we've talked about them before. The Pharisees were the ones who wanted to freeze every piece of the understanding of God and God's law in place, in, and it, nothing about, there was nothing new to be learned about God. There was no new laws. Everything would be just like it's always been. They built this fence around the law so that we couldn't get close to breaking the rules because the rules were perfect and we couldn't possibly break them. And that's all God wanted was us keeping rules. So they were the most faithful that there was. Well, Jesus compared the Pharisees and their law-keeping and freezing their relationship with God in rule-keeping. He compared them to the servant who buried his talent in the ground so it would be safe and unchained. Not a penny added to it, not a penny lost from it. Everything would remain the same. The other two servants, I got no idea if they represented any religious structure or any groups of their time. But what they, what they represented was a growing relationship with God. They represented taking chances and doing what you got to do to build a relationship with God. They didn't think that everything was frozen. They didn't think that everything, nothing about what we know about God could ever change. They believed 
that God was still in the revelation business. God was still about apocalypse, if you will. How many of us believe that God continues to act in this world and reveals God's presence and God's will and stuff to us through prayers, meditations, and other ways? How many of us believe that? Well, this is a good thing. Because this is a good thing because the next sentence says, since we believe that God is still in the revelation business, I could have been in a lot of trouble if all of you sat there with your hands down. Since we believe that God is in the revelation business, and we have just read one of those permanent lessons that Jesus taught, from which we are supposed to be able to receive some of God's revelation, what might God be trying to tell us today? Well, I don't know what you've got yet, but you can tell me later if you want. This is what I've got. Those who are like the Pharisees, like the last servant, those who believe that God stopped the revelation process when the 66 books of the Bible were closed. God hasn't spoken anymore. Those people who believe that the Bible says what it says, means what it means, and it's never, no meaning of the scripture has ever been different than it is today. Those people are not truly in step with God and the relationship that God wants to have with us. They do not have the kind of faith that God wants them to have and they are not engaged in that two-way relationship that God wants every one of us to have. Now, it's not that I think that trying to squeeze God into that box it makes them cord wood for the fires of hell. I don't think that at all. Those folks just take no chances with their faith and they look to me like the third servant who got no praise from Jesus. Now I do believe that there's a strong possibility that they are doing the best they can. And I know that I'm doing the best I can. My relationship with God is probably not what God wants out of it yet either. So we all do the best we can to build that relationship. And the ones who are like the first two servants are trying to have a relationship with God. They take chances with their faith. And I say that we can tell that they take chances, you see, because as long as we have had money, we haven't always had money, but as long as we have had money, people have had to take chances with their money in order to make more money. All right? You know, those, particularly those who farm, have that right in front of them all the time. They buy stuff and they put it in the ground. If it doesn't rain, you know, if it doesn't rain or the wind blows at the wrong time or a whole bunch of things can go wrong and all the money that they had, that they put in the ground, they may as well put on double zero on the roulette wheel because they took a big chance. Sometimes you get it back, sometimes you don't. That's what taking chances are. But they have to have the faith to put that stuff out there in the first place. They take a chance. Many of us have money in the stock market. And I've been watching mine. I'd like to watch it this way, but I've been watching it that way. What are you going to do? You take a chance. People have always taken chances. That's why they say you, you have to have money to make money. But it occurs to me with all this chance taking, what would the master have said to the first two servants if when he came back, they had taken a chance with his money and lost every dime. Mmm. Would that change the story? Well, I prayed on that for a while, and, and I got this kind of idea back, so maybe I had me a little apocalypse there. I hope so. Let's assume for the moment that the economic times are what they were when I was in my late 20s. 
Inflation was going crazy, but so was the stock market. Stock market was paying 30%. Bank loan, bank, uh, what do you call it? CDs were paying 11%. Times are good and we have some money to invest. Then let's say one of our kids, one of our best friends says, they've got a business they want to start up. They've got an idea, but they don't have any money. We have some money and they have an idea. We decide to invest our money with them. For some reason, something neither they nor we could see because we looked at their business plan with them. We liked it. It made sense to us. So we invested our money in for something that we couldn't see and they couldn't see came along, impacted their business, and after three years, they had lost all our money. Now, it wasn't like they wasted any of it. They didn't buy new cars, new houses and stuff for themselves. They lived low, drove 10-year-old automobiles, did everything they could to keep to play the money right. And still, even with all their hard work, it failed. Oh, we'd be upset with the loss of the money, wouldn't we? But if we watched them work hard, how upset would we be with them? We were going to take a risk with that money anyway. You know, sure, we might have bought Microsoft at 75 cents a share and be bazillionaires. We also might have bought Amstrad. <laughs> Who's heard of them? Right? They were out there back then. You never know. We took a chance. We knew we were taking a chance when we took one. Now, would we be more or less upset if they had taken our money and put it in a wall safe for three years? They lost their courage. We weren't paying any attention. They lost their nerve and didn't start that business and put our money in a wall safe. And after three years, they decided they probably ought to give it back. So they give us back our money. There's our money. Same amount we put in. Remember what I said about CD? 11%. We could have made 33%, plus a little more. You'd pay 11% and 11%, 11%, 11%. Something about piling on there, you know. We'd have made more than a 33% on our money. If they had just put it in the CD, they could have made 30% a year if they put it in the, in the right stuff in the stock market. Instead, we get back zero growth. Hey, they knew we were going to invest it. We could have put it in the bank or the stock market, but we gave it to them, and they give us back zero return. Now, how mad are you about that? They put my money in a wall safe. What were they thinking? They broke faith with me. They broke faith with whoever gave them that money. They broke faith with us because they knew we were going to invest that money. We were going to get, we were going to take a chance. We were going to make some money with our money. But they broke faith with us. We'd be upset. And see, that's what the message that I think Jesus wants us to get. Jesus is not asking us to take no chances and to make everything stay the same. To grab the whole world and figure out that there's only one way to spread the gospel. And if, what, if that's the way you do it, and if that doesn't work, well, to hell with them all, literally. That's not what he said. I think Jesus is talking about relationships. Our relationship with one another. Those people who trust one another. How many of us married here? Okay? Tell me something. Well, tell me something. I don't want to hear y'all talking at once. You and your spouse, do y'all love one another exactly the same as you did when you first started dating? Or when you first got married? Now, if you've been married more than three or four years, I'm guessing it's a lot better now than it was then. Otherwise, you wouldn't still be married over three or four years. Our relationship with each other grow and we change and we interact with one another. Who would want to have the same relationship with your spouse that you had when you were when you first met? No, not me either. No hands out there. The reason? We like each other better now. You know? Things are different. We're different. 
that relationship would no longer be fulfilling. God wants a relationship with us like that that is fulfilling day after day, growing and growing as we interact with God and become more God's sons and daughters. Well, you know, that always requires taking a chance. Every relationship requires taking chances. I look at this congregation and I know that we've taken chances before. If we weren't going to take chances, you know where we'd be? Who knows where we'd be if this congregation never took a chance? Raw Street. Even the bank hasn't been able to buy any more parking at Raw Street. And they got more money than we did. If we hadn't moved to where we could get all these people in here, we'd be smaller than we are now if we wouldn't be gone. We had to take a chance. Look at this. It didn't spring up like a mushroom overnight. It took people working hard and bringing their money to the church and putting it in here and expecting that to grow. And here we are. This happened in 1957. 67? Still a long time ago. And there were still chances to be taken. We took a chance in the name of the Lord and it has worked out for us. How about that? Taking a chance in our relationship with God is exactly what God expects us to do. And when we do, mostly it works out for us because that's what God wants for us. When we claim Jesus is our Savior and Lord, we do not promise Him we will stay the same. We do not promise that we will never take a risk. We promise to take some chances. We promise to stick our necks out. We promise to take a chance on not being popular, have people say, people say that we're weird because we actually believe in Jesus Christ. We, God expects us to take chances and we have made promises that we will take chances. Faithfulness the bottom line for Jesus Christ is keeping those promises. 